Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So we've got another video for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus for you today. This is going to be a starter guide for the device itself. I've already done an in-depth review and I've showed you how to add a new PCB to an existing Retroid Pocket 2. But this video, we're going to show you how to set this device up from zero to hero. And this is only going to be part one of two. In this video in particular, we're going to focus on initial setup as well as getting some of those classic systems up and running via RetroArch. So that's going to be Game Boy all the way up through Super Nintendo. And in part two of this guide, I'll help you set up some of the more advanced systems, things like Nintendo 64 all the way up through PlayStation 2. Now, this device has the luxury of using Android 9 as its back end, so if you're familiar with Android gaming, you actually might be right at home already. And there's some great advantages of having an Android based system. For example, this has a sleep mode much like any other Android phone or tablet, which makes it very easy for pick up and play gaming. But all the same, this runs a special front end that we're going to focus on here in this video called the Retroid Launcher. And there are other front end solutions, which I'll probably cover in a different video, but for now, we're going to stick with what comes in the box. And we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump into part one of the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus Starter Guide. Okay, right out the gate, first thing you need to know, this device does not come with a micro SD card. You need to bring your own to the table. At the very least, I recommend getting a 128 gig card because that's going to store a lot of good games, but you could go all the way up to 256 or even 512 if you'd like. Either way, make sure you get an SD card before we get started. Now you're probably already familiar with all the buttons that come on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus because you've probably watched a few YouTube reviews before buying one. And so I'm not going to belabor any of that, but I will make note of the fact that it has a micro HDMI out as well as USB-C for both charging and data. And this here is your micro SD card slot as well as the headphone jack. Okay, that's your quick hardware refresher. Let's go ahead and jump into the software now. We're gonna boot it up. Now I'm gonna cut through some of these loading screens just to save time, but once it's all done and loaded, you're gonna get this welcome screen here. And this is what they call the initial setup wizard. Now, first thing you wanna do is pick your language. It's gonna to default to English. And then also set up your internet. This is gonna be as simple as just turning on your Wi-Fi, finding the network, and then logging in. And I'm gonna skip this part because I don't want you guys seeing my stuff. Anyway, once that's done, go ahead and hit next and then you can set up your time zone. Now, the next thing you have to decide is whether or not you wanna have Google Play services enabled. Now, this is a two-edged sword. For example, it's gonna allow you to access the Google Play Store to be able to download games and whatnot. But while it's running, it also takes up a little bit of RAM. And this isn't a permanent choice here. You actually can turn this off in the settings later on. But I would recommend keeping it on just because we're gonna to need to have the Google Play Store later. Next, it's gonna show you a bunch of different pre-installed apps and whether or not you wanna have them on your device. We're actually gonna skip this section. We're gonna do this here in a minute. Now you have the choice of two different launchers when it first starts up. It doesn't really matter which one you use. I would recommend the bottom one though, just because we need to get into the settings quickly. So I'm gonna pick the ADSP launcher and then configuration is complete. Go ahead and press start and it'll bring you up to this main Android menu. So first thing you wanna do is go into the settings app and then scroll all the way down until you find the system section. And then again, scroll down to the bottom till you find the updater. Now here, it's gonna ask you to check for an update. As you can see, this is 1.005 here. So you just select the update and then let it run through its process. I'm going to fast forward this part just to save us a little bit of time. But after it's done, it's going to reboot and then install the system update. Now, unfortunately, the over the air updates for Retroid have not been cumulative. So you have to go through and do this several times to get up to speed and just keep doing this. And it'll get to a point where it says that there are no further updates. And so once it says that we're actually good to go, let's actually move up now to the handheld settings section and then scroll all the way down until you find the advanced section. Go into here and then select re-enter setup wizard. This is gonna take us back to that initial setup that we did previously. It's gonna give you a warning and say, do you really wanna do this? And you say, yeah, man, I wanna do it. Okay, and so once you're back in this, you can actually just tab through until you get back to that pre-installed app section. It's gonna remember all the settings from before. Now, as you can see here, the Dolphin emulator is actually updated now, and that's the most important one here. And I would actually recommend installing all of these. So I would go all the way down to the bottom, select all 14 and then press next. And it'll take a few minutes to install everything. So just kind of leave it there and it'll take care of itself. And then once it's done, it's gonna ask us to select a launcher again, but this time we're gonna pick the top one. Okay, and then once you're done, press start and we're ready to actually start configuring this device. Now, this is the Retroid launcher that I mentioned earlier in the video. And right now it's not showing anything. And that's because this is a grid style launcher that needs to have the actual apps added to it. So let's tap on the add app button. And then as you can see, it has a bunch of different apps that you can add right here and now. 
And these are all the apps that are pre-installed on the device. And it's going to be up to you what you choose to show here on these launcher apps. This isn't the only thing that's going to be available for you when it comes to menu navigation, but it is one of the many tools that you have available. And so I'm going to go through here and pick a few standalone emulators, as well as things like Google Play Store and Google Chrome. And once you've made all your choices, you can just press the back button here on the bottom left, and it's going to show you all the apps that you added. And you can do as many or as little as you'd like. But this is going to be really great if you have standalone emulators that you just want to have easy access to. But for now, let's get into the Google Play Store and start adding some new apps. When you first open it up, it's going to ask you to sign in with your Google account. And so again, I'm going to do that off screen so you don't see my stuff. But once that's done, you can go in and start searching for and installing apps, or you can go through your previous download history and just start grabbing some that you've already used, say, on your phone or a tablet. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm going through all of my previous downloads, and I'm just downloading some others that I think will be a good fit for this device. And so let me show you some recommendations when it comes to standalone apps. Now, in terms of emulators, a lot of them are already going to be pre-installed. Everything you see inside of that light blue box is going to be things that are already installed on the device. But I do recommend getting the apps that are highlighted in orange here. For example, Drastic is by far the best Nintendo DS emulator available on Android, and it costs $5. And additionally, the Aether SX2 app is a very new PlayStation 2 app and by far the best one available, and it's completely free. And if you're a big Sega Saturn fan, I would recommend checking out the Yabasan Shiro 2 Pro app because this one has some additional features and also removes ads and pop-ups and everything else like that. And the Regime emulator is similar to that as well, that if you buy an in-app purchase within the app, it's going to allow you to not have pop-ups either. Now, in addition to emulators, this device is pretty dang good at streaming. And so you have a couple options already installed on the device. There's Moonlight Game Streaming as well as Steam Link. But here are some other options that you have available. NVIDIA GeForce Now, AMD Link, and Parsec are all PC streaming apps that work very similar to Steam Link or Moonlight. But of course, you can also use Stadia to do cloud gaming through Google servers. And you could also stream from your PS4 or PS5 using PS Play. Now, PlayStation has its own official remote play app, but it won't actually work with the controls of the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus itself. So I recommend spending the $6 and getting PS Play instead. And finally, the Xbox Beta app will allow you to do remote play on your Xbox within your home network. Now, you can also do Xbox cloud streaming, but that's going to actually be done through the Xbox.com website. And then finally, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is a fully fledged Android system, which means that it can also play Android games. Now here's just a smattering of games that are available that do work well with the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And Horizon Chase is my favorite Android racing game, and that one's completely free. So really, you've got a lot of choice when it comes to Android games, but these nine here are good bets if you're just getting started. Okay, so once you've chosen your apps in the App Store and you just start kind of going through the installation process, you're going to be good to go after a few minutes. And after you've installed these apps, you have the opportunity to add them to that Retroid launcher as well. And so now you can make new pages, for example, of Android games or things like that. One thing to note is that if you run an update on an app, it's actually going to remove it from the Retroid launcher, so you'll have to re-add it later. And that's probably going to mess up the order of your tiles, so it's one of those things where you may have to remove and then add all of them again after you do a big update. Okay, a couple other setting tweaks that I recommend. If you go into settings and then display and then advanced, you can change the length of the sleep function. By default, it's set to one minute, but personally, I like to set it to 30 minutes because I hate it when the screen just goes black on me for no reason. But of course, that's going to be up to you. Another thing I recommend doing is go into the handheld settings section, and then under input, you have the ability to change your controller style. And so, for example, if you want to have the A and B swapped like on an Xbox, you can actually choose that instead of the retro style like a Nintendo controller. And this is only going to apply to the front end, not the actual games themselves. Okay, we're somewhat set up now, so I think it's time to start adding some games to our SD card. Now, in terms of cards, I recommend using a SanDisk or a Samsung card. These two companies tend to make the most reliable cards right now, so it's worth it to spend the extra dollar or so to make sure you get a name brand. And so all you have to do here is just kind of open up that slot and then put the card in and then push this cover back over. It's kind of annoying. Now, if you go into settings and then storage, you can see here it shows the disk here. And the moment you add the card to your device, it's going to pre-populate the card with several different standard Android folders. And so I recommend doing that just the first time around, and then you can actually just eject the SD card and pull it right out. And so now we're going to use a USB adapter to connect this to our PC. And I'll have links to all these products in my written guide, which is in the video description. Now, when it first pops up, you're going to see those pre-populated Android folders again. And we're actually not going to touch any of these. We're going to make our own folder to put all of our games inside. So let's go ahead and right click here and select new folder 
and you guessed it, we're going to call it games. Now inside here, the first thing you want to do is add a BIOS folder. Now BIOS files are basically system files that help certain emulators run properly. And these files are copyrighted, so I can't share them or anything else like that. You're going to be on your own to find them. But it's very easy to just Google for something like, say, a RetroArch BIOS pack. And I'll leave a list of the common BIOS files in my written guide as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into the BIOS folder and make a PS2 folder. And in here I'm going to add some specific PS2 BIOS files. And again, these BIOS files are something that you'll have to dump from an original PlayStation 2 or find them on the internet. And then additionally, I'm going to add all of my standard BIOS files that I use on basically every handheld system. Things like my Dreamcast BIOS files, Sega CD, Game Boy Advance, and so on. And many of these emulators don't actually need these BIOS files, but it does improve the gameplay experience. Either way, just find a BIOS pack and then add it to a BIOS folder. It's really not as scary as it sounds. Next, we're going to make a bunch of different game folders to put our different game system files in. And again, these are also copyrighted, so I'm not going to share any resources here. But at a minimum, I recommend doing folders for Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, NES, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, GameCube, and then also our Sega system, so Game Gear, Genesis, Saturn, Dreamcast, and then our Sony systems too, so PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and PSP. And these are the systems that we're going to focus on on these guides too. There are many other things that can be played on here, for example, Amiga or arcade games. And I'll cover a little bit of that stuff in the next video, but for now we're going to just stick to the fundamentals, things like Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. And so now I'm just going through and choosing my ROMs. And it's just going to be a matter of drag and drop into these folders. One thing I do recommend is when you grab ROM files, make sure that they are using the no intro naming convention. What that means is basically it's going to show the name of the game, and then in parentheses it'll say the region, like USA, and so on. And another thing to note, as of today, the Retroid launcher is very specific about what game file types it'll actually accept. And I know the team is actually working on an update for this, but for now, things like Super Nintendo need to be in a specific format. In this case, they need to be SMC files. But to make it easier on you, here is a table of all the common file types that are accepted in the Retroid launcher itself. And so as you're building a ROM library to put onto your SD card, these are the file types that I recommend using. Many file types are going to be in a zipped format, so you're going to want to open up that zip file and then see if within that zip file it has the correct file type. Now most of these are the standard file types that you're going to find for most of these ROMs. But like I mentioned, Super Nintendo is a little bit odd because SMC is not the predominant file type. That's actually the SFC file type. And in addition, Saturn and Dreamcast seem to work best with CHD files in particular. And you might find others out there, for example, GDI or CDI files for Dreamcast. Those don't work very well with the Retroid launcher. And same thing with PS1. The most popular file types for PS1 games are bin and Q files. The problem is that both bin and Q need to be used in order to run properly, and when you drop both of those into your folder, the Retroid launcher is going to think that you just added two versions of the same game. And so it's going to create a bunch of management issues. And in that sense, I do recommend using CHD or PPB files instead. But anyway, I'll have this table in the written guide, so you can just go ahead and consult this later on, and I'll keep it updated as they improve the Retroid Launcher too. Now another great resource is the Retro Handhelds website, and if you scroll down about three quarters of the way down the page, you're going to find the wiki section, and in here they have a Retroid Pocket 2 Plus game settings spreadsheet. And inside this spreadsheet, it'll have a listing of all the games for all the various popular systems and how each of those games play on this device. But in particular, we need to go to the GameCube section because there's a specific file File that we need to grab from this spreadsheet. And that's going to be these community config files that you find here in this link. So just click on this link, it's going to take you to a mega website, and then just download this very small MMJR settings file. This is going to be necessary to get the best GameCube performance. Now once you've downloaded that zip file, go ahead and extract that file so that you can get everything within the zip folder. And in particular, we need to have these Dolphin and GFX INI files. Now, we're not going to mess with these until the next starter guide video, but we're going to set all this stuff up right now first. So all you want to do is on your SD card, go into that GameCube folder, and then grab those INI files. And you can also grab the README file in case you want to consult it later. But yeah, that's about all we have to do for the SD card. Just make your game folders and your BIOS folders, add all your games and ROMs, and then we're good to go. Let's eject the SD card and put it back into our device. And of course, you can always go and add more games later. For example, if you decide you want to do 3DO games at some point, you can add those as well. 
Now, before I forget, one last thing is that you can transfer over files without taking out the SD card. And all you have to do is plug a USB cable into your computer and then plug it into the device. And all you have to do is tap the file transfer button and that's gonna allow you to connect to the SD card via your computer. So that's a handy tip if you don't wanna take your SD card in and out every time you wanna add a game. Okay, so now we've loaded up our SD card, we've put it into our device, and now we're ready to start configuring things. And the first thing we're gonna work on is RetroArch, and it's actually called RetroArch, I just have a bad habit of saying RetroArch. And this is a Swiss Army Knife emulator that basically allows you to play a lot of the old systems really well. And it also allows you to fine tune your settings to the nth degree. And the skin that this one initially comes with, I'm not a big fan of it. It just seems a little bit unintuitive. The fact that you have to scroll down and then there's tabs on the right side, it's just a little bit weird. So I'm gonna swap this out for something a little bit more familiar. I'm gonna press right twice to get into settings, and then I'm gonna select drivers, and then I'm gonna select menu. Here, I'm gonna change it to XMB, which is the cross media bar from the PlayStation 3. Once I'm done with that, I'm gonna go back to the main menu and then select configuration file, save current configuration. We're gonna end up using this option a lot as we navigate through RetroArch. Okay, so once we've changed out our configuration file, we can go back to the main menu and then select Quit RetroArch. Now when we open up RetroArch again, we have something that looks a lot like the PlayStation 3 menu, but it's also a little bit small, so let's change that. We're going to go into the Settings tab, which is the second tab on the right here, and then we're going to select User Interface. Next, we're going to select Appearance and then Menu Scale Factor, and let's increase this from 1.0 to 1.5. And as you can see, it now looks a lot bigger. This is actually a lot easier to see. So now that I'm happy with the way the menu looks, we're gonna save this. So we're gonna go back to configuration file, save current configuration. And this is the way to save system-wide across Retromark. Next, we're gonna go into online updater, then core downloader. And we're gonna start downloading the emulators that we're gonna wanna use with Retromark. And there are many that you can choose from here and I recommend experimenting with these, but I'm just gonna go through the bare bones list that most people are gonna to wanna to see. For example, there are plenty of different arcade emulators available, but I think that Final Burn Neo might be your best introductory arcade emulator because this one works really well with a lot of Capcom as well as Neo Geo games. So I'm gonna download that one first. But you could also set up MAME arcade systems and you could even jump into some Atari gameplay, but we're gonna kind of gloss over those and just go straight into the big stuff. So starting with Nintendo, we're gonna run through each of these. Number one, you're not gonna wanna have DS because the Drastic emulator is better. But for Game Boy, Game Boy Color, I do recommend the Gambate Core. Now when it comes to Game Boy Advance, a couple of these are actually pretty good, but I recommend the MGBA one. For Nintendo, the FCEUMM is my favorite, but Nestopia and Quick NES are actually pretty good too. We're not gonna bother with Nintendo 64 because that works better with a standalone emulator. And for Super Nintendo, you have several choices as well, but I recommend the SNES 9X Current Core because this one seems to be all around the easiest entry Super Nintendo emulator. Okay, further scrolling down, we don't need to worry about Dreamcast, that's gonna be a standalone. But for Genesis and Sega CD and Game Gear, I recommend Genesis Plus GX. And if you're gonna do 32X, I recommend grabbing Pico Drive as well. Same thing with Saturn, we're gonna just skip over this one here, we're gonna use the standalone emulator. And then for PlayStation, I do recommend the PCSX Rearmed Core. We'll get into that one in the next video. But that's really it, those are the basics we're gonna cover here today. So now let's talk about video setup. Now this device has a four x three aspect ratio display, which is gonna work really well for most classic systems. And when it comes to scaling, I recommend not making any changes to this at all. For example, integer scaling is gonna give you nice crisp pixels, but it's also gonna make your screen smaller. And then aspect ratio is already set to core provided, which is what I recommend as well. Now to improve the pixel scaling, we're actually gonna use filters, and that's gonna be under this section here, under video filters. Here, I'm gonna set it to the normal 2X filter. And this filter is gonna improve your scaling without having to shrink down to integer scaling. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. The thing about filters is that sometimes they can slow down games, but for Super Nintendo and below, you can have a filter on and it's not gonna affect a performance. And that's because the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is a pretty powerful system. Next, we're gonna go into input and we're gonna change up some of the things here. First thing we wanna do is go into port one controls. And there's a couple of these buttons that we actually need to set. For example, the A, B, X, Y are gonna be swapped on this device. So what I recommend doing here is picking the button that you see in the picture and then pushing down on that button as it shows in the picture. It's going to think you're pushing down on the opposite button because the A, B, X, Y are swapped on this device, but just follow these prompts and push on the corresponding button as you see in the picture and you'll be just fine. And then also paradoxically, the select button is not properly mapped either, so we do wanna go in here and press the select button too. And just for good measure, might as well do the start button. 
Okay, so now that we set up those port one controls, it's actually gonna swap our A and B buttons in the menu. So here you wanna go into the menu controls and then select menu swap okay and cancel buttons. That'll make it so the A button is the confirm button and the B is the cancel button. Okay, and in this same menu, we're gonna go into the hotkeys section. This is gonna set up all the different hotkeys we can use while in game. First thing is the confirm quit button. This is gonna make you press the quit button twice. For the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, I actually recommend turning this one off. Next, we wanna adjust the hotkey enable button. This is gonna be our primary hotkey. And I recommend using the select button for this one. That means that select plus any other button are gonna be your hotkeys. So now I'm just gonna kinda of whiz through some of the other hotkeys and I'll have a table here at the end as well. For the fast forward toggle button, I recommend using the R2 button. That means when you tap select an R2, it's going to toggle fast forward on and off. Now going further down, I also like to enable the load state button. This is gonna be the L1 button here. And similarly, I like to make R1 the save state button. That means if you press select an R1, it's gonna save a state. And then when you press select an L1, it's gonna load that state. Now on the opposite side of fast forward, there is a rewind. So you're gonna set this one to the L2 button. And that's gonna be your four major hotkeys for the shoulder buttons. You can save and load a state as well as fast forward and rewind your game. Okay, another important one is gonna be the quit RetroArch button. Now this one is going to basically close out of RetroArch every time you're done playing a game. Typically you're gonna to wanna to do select and start for this, but these two buttons are too close together. It's kind of awkward to push them both. So instead I recommend doing select and A. That's a combo you're probably not gonna press very often and that means that you're not gonna close out of this inadvertently. But of course you could try a different button if you'd rather not use that one. I also like using the reset game hotkey. That's gonna be select and B. And that's gonna be the equivalent of pressing the reset button on your Nintendo system. Okay, and a few others that I personally like, I like to have the show frames per second button mapped to the Y button. That's gonna allow me to see how well each of these games are emulated as I'm playing them. Another one I like to do is the X button for the menu toggle. That means when you press select an X when in game, it's gonna bring up this RetroArch menu. And finally, we also need to set up run ahead. This is basically a way to reduce latency when you're playing a game, which is very important for Android. And this isn't something you're gonna press very often. And so because of that, I like to do select and up. So I'm gonna set the run ahead to up and I'll show you a demonstration of this later in the video. Okay, so I bet that was pretty overwhelming. So here is a table of all of those buttons that I just talked about. And again, I'll have this table in the written guide so you can look at it later. And of course, these hotkeys are just my recommendations. For example, if you don't like the idea of hitting select an A on accident and accidentally quitting RetroArch, then you can obviously change that to another button. Something like select and down is something you will probably rarely push. But really, it's all gonna be your choice. So whatever feels intuitive to you, that's what I would go for. Okay, so in addition to having these hotkeys to allow you to load and save states, I'm also gonna set it up so that it's gonna save a state every time you close a game and then load it back up every time you start it up. So you just wanna go into settings, then saving, and then here there are two options you need to turn on. One is called auto save state and the other one is called load state automatically. And when you turn both of these on, that means that when you close out of a game using the select an A button, it's gonna save where you were right when you press that button. And then the next time you open up that game, it's gonna go right back to that same place. And I find that to be super convenient. And so the last fundamental thing we need to do for RetroArch is we need to point RetroArch to our BIOS folder. So you wanna go into settings, then directory, then system BIOS, and then find that folder. You're gonna find it in storage, and then there's gonna be a bunch of numbers which indicates your SD card. And then go into your games and then BIOS folder, and then select use this directory. And that's it, now it's gonna look in that folder for the BIOS files that we added earlier. Now, all we have to do is save the current configuration and quit out of RetroArch, where you're good to go. And so now we're gonna set up that emulation station style interface that we saw at the very beginning of this video. And you're gonna find that under the emulators button here on the bottom left. And it's gonna be blank at first, but don't worry, we're gonna add our systems here. So once you tap that systems button, you're gonna see all the different options you have available. Now the system options that you do have are not comprehensive. For example, Sega Genesis, Nintendo DS, Sega Saturn, those are not even featured on this list. And Retroid is aware of this and they're working on a fix for it. So maybe by the time you actually update your system, you'll actually have those options. But for now, it just kind of covers like 75% of the systems that you're probably gonna to wanna to play on this device. And so there's a couple ways that you can set this up. For example, you can do what I just did here and just picked a bunch of different systems and then hit the OK button. And then you can see them here. The problem is they're in like no sort of order at all. 
And so if you want to have like a nice clean system, then you're going to want to have to add these one at a time. So first thing you want to do is remove all the systems and then just go in and add one and then hit OK and then add another and then hit OK. And you just kind of keep going through this motion here. And the order that you add these systems is the order they're going to appear in this line. It's kind of annoying that you can't just move these around at will. But either way, this is how you're going to set things up if you're a little bit OCD like me. And so here's the finished product. We have all of our handheld Nintendo systems, then our consoles, then we move over to Sega, and then Sony, and then Arcade. And that just looks a lot better to me. So we're going to go down the line and start setting these systems up. We're going to start with Game Boy. Now within each of these system sections, we need to do two things. We need to set up the emulator and then add our games. Setting up the emulator is super easy. We press the edit button and then we check to see what emulator is enabled. Now luckily with this one, it has the RetroArch Gambate Core first. So we actually don't need to do anything here. We can just press done. Now let's set up the games. We're going to tap the ROMs button and then select add and then choose our disk here. And as you can see here, here is the file structure from our SD card. Now go into the game section and then press A on the Game Boy folder for a second and it's going to give it a check mark. From there, just tap the select button and then go ahead and check mark that folder and then press scan. This is going to scan through that folder, find all of the Game Boy games and then load them into the device. And if your ROM files are named properly, it's going to grab the box art too. And so as you can see here with the Game Boy, all of them were named correctly and I have this beautiful box art to go with the game. Okay, so let's start up a game. Let's do Metroid 2 and we'll see how this all works. Now, first thing I noticed is that I forgot to take off the on-screen overlay. And this is a good opportunity to show you how to make RetroArch changes right here and now. So we're going to press Select and X to get into the menu. And then we're going to select Close Content. That way we have no games or anything loaded right now. From there, we're going to go into Settings, then On-Screen Display, and then turn off the Display Overlay. From there, we're going to do Save Current Configuration. Next, we can quit out of RetroArch, and then open up the game again. And then when we open it up, two things are going to happen. One, it's going to auto-load your save state, as you can see here on the bottom, and it's gotten rid of that on-screen overlay too. And so now let me show you some colorization options. We're going to get into the quick menu again by pressing Select and X. We're going to go down to Options, and then Game Boy Colorization. Here we're going to select Internal, and then below that we're going to select Internal Palette, and then here are all the different colorization options you have for Game Boy. Personally, I like one called Special One, so that's the one we're going to use here in this video. On top of that, I like to go into the Interframe Blending section and then turn on LCD Ghosting. This is going to mimic the look and feel of a traditional Game Boy, and I think that looks really nice. Now if you swipe left from the right side of the screen, this will bring up the RetroArch kind of in-game menu. This will allow you to do things like take a screenshot or use a key mapper for Android games. And there's also a speed up button, which is going to free up memory in case you have other apps running in the background. But really not a lot to talk about here, I just wanted to show you where that was and why it is that you have a faint white line on the side of your screen. You can turn this off in the settings if you'd like as well. Now colorization is one of those things where you don't actually have to save anything, it's just going to remember that. So for example, if we open up another Game Boy game, it's going to remember that special one colorization. Okay, so now let's talk about rewind for a second. If you press select an R2 just out of the box, it's actually not going to work. It's not going to rewind anything at all. And that's because rewind needs to be enabled. So in this case, we're going to press select an X to get into the quick menu again. And we're going to select the rewind button and then turn on rewind support. And so from there, we can save the fact that it's going to rewind. And we can do this via overrides. There's three different options here. You can do a save core override or a content directory override or a game override. In a nutshell, a core override means that every game that runs the Gambate core, which includes Game Boy and Game Boy Color, are now going to have rewind turned on. If you do save content directory, that means that only things within the Game Boy folder are going to have rewind turned on. And finally, if you use the save game overrides, that means that only this one game is going to have the rewind turned on. And this is all going to be your choice, but I do recommend using Rewind for the safe core override. And that's because even though Rewind support does have some sort of performance tax on it, you're not actually going to notice that with Game Boy and Game Boy Color. These are too lightweight of systems to actually matter. So we're going to do save core overrides here for the Rewind function. And so now, say we open up a different game like Metroid 2. First thing you'll notice is that it auto-loaded our save state. But now if we press select an R2, it's actually going to rewind the game. Now this isn't going to work for an infinite amount of time, but you are going to be able to get 5, maybe 10 seconds of rewind there. Okay, I would say that Game Boy is good to go now. Let's go ahead and get into Game Boy Color. Now setting this up is going to be the exact same as we just did for Game Boy. We're going to open up this Game Boy Color section. We're not going to see anything there, so we need to add the ROMs path. 
And same thing here, it's going to scan all the games, and if they're named properly, you're going to get all the box art too. And I got lucky again, all of my games are working properly. So let's open up one of these games and see how everything looks. We'll start with Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. And right off the bat, everything looks good. We don't have to worry about colorization because Game Boy Color is already colored. And some of those changes that we applied are going to affect this one as well. For example, Rewind is going to work on Game Boy Color because we did a save core override. And so yeah, Game Boy Color is working just fine now. But let me show you how fast forward works. So this is as simple as just tapping select an R2 and that's going to turn on fast forward and it's going to stay that way until you press select an R2 again. Anyway, that's Game Boy Color. We're good to go. Let's go over to Game Boy Advance now. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to be the same process for setting up Game Boy Advance as we just did twice earlier. So we're going to select ROMs and then add and then go into the folder itself and then scan the folder. All that fun stuff that we've already seen a couple times already. Now, once it's done scanning, you're going to get all of your games again. And the first thing you may notice is that a couple of these games didn't get the proper box art added to them. And so we'll add those here in a minute. But first, we need to make sure that the emulator itself is working properly. And to do that, we need to go into the edit section and then make sure we have selected the correct core. And as you can see here, it's showing VBA next. But if you remember, we downloaded the MGBA core. So it's as simple as just swapping them out, pressing save, and then done. Now let's try opening up a game. And as you can see here, it's popping up correctly. On top of that, it's showing the Game Boy Advance splash screen, which means the BIOS files are loading as well. And honestly, Game Boy Advance looks great. It's scaling properly. It has a three by two aspect ratio and it's using that normal 2x filter to give it a proper scaling for those pixels. And so all in all, this is probably going to be the optimal way to play Game Boy Advance on a 4x3 screen like this. So now let's do something about the box arts. As you can see here, I have Celeste Classic on the Game Boy Advance. This is actually a port of the Pico 8 game, and you can find this just by googling. It's pretty awesome. But of course, because it's not an official Nintendo game, it doesn't have any official box art that can get scraped from the source. So what you want to do here is long press on the box itself, and it's going to give you a few options. You can do the box cover, which we'll do in a second. And you can also choose to ignore this ROM, which will remove it. And then you can also rename it too, if you'd like. Under the box cover section, you have three different sources. One is your own device in case you already saved off the covers. Or you can go online and use the games database or Google images. Let's try games database first. It's going to give you a quick tip on how to do this, but I'm going to walk you through it. It's going to open up Google Chrome in the games database. And lucky enough, there actually is a box art for this one in the database. So just long press on the image, scroll down to the bottom, and find download image. There might be a few confirmation windows you have to go through, but after that you're good to go. Just go ahead and exit out of Chrome, and as you can see here, it now has the box art. So there was one other game that didn't have the correct box art, and that is Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. So long press here again, we'll go into box cover, we'll try the game's database. But as you can see here, it actually didn't find the box art. So no problem, we'll go back into box cover and then do a Google photo search instead. And then scrolling down here, right here is the box art. So long press on this one instead, and then select download image. It's really the same process as it is with the game's database. And just like that, we now have the box art. So that's how you add box art to games in this Retroid launcher. Okay, our Nintendo handheld systems are good to go. Now let's get into the home consoles. We'll start with NES. And same thing here, I'm actually just going to fast forward this part, but you want to go through your games folder, find the NES folder, and then scan everything. And once it's done scanning, you'll have all of your box art. And if you're lucky, there's not going to be any missing. But as you can see, there's quite a few missing on this one here. And again, this is going to be the exact same process. So if we long press on Double Dragon 2, you can see it's not available in the games database. And I suspect that's because it has the Rev A after the name here, because this is a revision version of the ROM. But if we do a Google image search, it almost always comes up with the correct box art. So same thing here, we're just going to save that image back out of Chrome, and there we go, we have it there. Now I'm not going to bore you with the process of adding the box art all over again, but you know the deal at this point. You basically just long press on the image and then select box cover and then go and download the image. But like with Game Boy Advance, we need to make sure it's using the correct emulator. So we'll go into edit and then we will choose the FCEUMM core because that's the one we downloaded. Then we're going to select save and done, and let's try loading up a game. Here's Batman the video game. And as you can see here, it's working just fine. And so we're basically good to go with Nintendo. You would need to put on rewind if you wanted, but other than that, we're basically good to go with Nintendo. So let's go ahead and move on to Super Nintendo now. Same thing here, we're going to scan that game path, and it's going to pull up all of my Super Nintendo games and try to grab the box art for all of them. But as you can see, some of them also don't have the correct box art. And we'll add those later, I'm not going to worry about it right now. Now, by default, Super Nintendo uses the SNES 9X current core, so we don't need to go in and edit anything. We can just load up games right here and now. 
So we'll start with one of the hardest games to emulate on the system, which is Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. And as you can see, despite having a filter 2x turned on, it's still getting full speed. We're getting 60 frames per second. And so the way I see it, if this game can get 60 frames per second with that normal 2x filter on, then basically every Super Nintendo game is going to play flawlessly. And so now's a good time to talk about run ahead latency. In general, Android is known for having a little bit more latency than something like Linux. But luckily, this device is powerful enough to be able to use something that they call run ahead. And long story short, this option will reduce input latency, which is something that's pretty important in systems like Super Nintendo and Nintendo. And so if you're playing a game and it just feels a little bit laggy, then that's what you're going to want to do. Press select and up to turn on the run ahead. And really, it's as simple as that. Okay, so really that's about it for the part one of the starter guide. I wanted to give you some initial orientation with the interface itself, and then how to set up those classic systems in RetroArch. And that's because RetroArch itself is a fairly complex beast, and it does take some time to get used to it. But I do hope that some of these tips that you found in this video are going to help you along your way. Now in a few days, I'm going to release the part two of this starter guide, and that's going to include standalone emulators. And so if you want to learn how to play things like Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast on this device, then I recommend tuning into that. And the easiest way to tune into that is to like and subscribe. And so if you aren't subscribed already, you know what to do. Either way, thanks for watching and be sure to let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. And also be sure to check out the written guide that I have in the video description. Anyway, we will see you next time. Happy gaming.